everybody. Welcome to our very first Riders Live event of 2024. We are in our 16th year doing this series. Um, I would like to thank our friends at the Palm Beach County Library System. Without them, this event would not be possible. Thank you to those who are already a friend. If you are interested in becoming a friend of the library, we do have some brochures at this table right over here that you are welcome to take home. I'd also like to thank our friends at Murder on the Beach. We have books for sale. We have both The Last Mona Lisa and The Lost Van Gogh. Um, they are both 1818. And if you purchase one, you will be doing a book signing. I'd like to introduce our very special guest. John <laughs> Jonathan Skinloper is the award-winning author of The Last Lone Mona Lisa, The Death Artist, The Widower's Notebook, and more. Jonathan is the recipient of two National Endowment for the Arts grants and has been a visiting artist at the American Academy in Rome, the Vermont Studio Center, and served on the board of Yado, one of the oldest arts communities in the U.S. Also a well-known artist, Jonathan's work has been exhibited in more than 200 exhibitions worldwide and is included in numerous private, corporate, and public collections, among them the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Newark Museum, and Tokyo's Institute of Contemporary Art. And without further ado, please give a warm welcome to Jonathan St. Thank you. Um, as some people know, I thought I was going to be in Palm Beach, so I had to like circumnavigate, but <clears throat> it's sort of thrilling for me, as you all heard me belt out. My high school best friend is here. Three of my astonishing cousins are here. Two other friends from high school are here. So this means there are people here who've known me since I was like 15, right? Way younger than that. Oh, that's true. My cousins have known me. <laughs> Right, right, right. Anyhow, it, it's so nice to be here. I have to say that um, Monday night was the launch of my book in New York. And if you know, McNally Jackson has three bookstores. Their new bookstore on the, at the seaport is just like this kind of fantasy bookstore, totally beautiful. And I don't know if some of you follow literary people, but my conversation was with Joyce Carol Oates, who is just like the most astonishing person, and every time I would try and ask her a question, she would say, oh, no, no, Johnny, we're talking about you. But I knew half the audience had to be there for her, you know? <laughs> um, in any case, well, I'm going to brag, because the book has been out for less than a week, and today it hit uh, the USA bestseller list, and two other bestseller lists. So, thank you. And um, everybody on Facebook is saying, congratulations and happy birthday. It's not my birthday. I, so Facebook, social media gets a lot of things wrong. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about this book and the book that preceded. This sounds so loud to me. Is it like reverberating, like... Yes. yes. Just one minute. No. No. Okay. No. No. But if I further away, you won't hear it at all. But okay. So I thought I'd talk about some things, and then um, if you ask me questions, I will answer. Them. I will. I. You know, it's sort of easier for me when people ask me things. I mean, I do have a little two pages of the beginning of the book that I can read, but I always think since all of you will be buying the book, that you, I won't have to read. <laughs> And I only say that, well, I do say it for that, for book sale reasons, but the other thing is that I worry about the future of books, you know, I really do. And um, I love books, I love libraries, I was married to a librarian, um, and uh, anyhow, so a little bit about me, although the people who've known me since I was born don't do it, but for the, the other people. So, I would say, and I, um, I think this gives hope to a lot of people, which is that I was, I was a very poor student. Uh, my friend Richie can attest to that. Yeah, I was not a good student at all. Um, and I didn't find out until I went to art school that I was dyslexic. 
And so I couldn't read at all. And it's pretty bizarre that I became a writer. But my one of my first days in art school, um, I was going to say I was a, a, a bad student, but I had one talent, which is I could draw. And it, it really helped me survive, having that talent. And so I did go to art school because they didn't care about my grades. They only cared about my portfolio. And thanks to our art teacher, Miss Smith, who drew on top of a lot of my drawings, um, I got into art school. And um, it was extraordinary for me. But the first week, the art school I went to was Boston University School of Fine Arts, which, if you don't know, it's, a, it's actually the most old-fashioned art school in America. It is an academy school. So we had things like every day a three-hour drawing workshop, every day a three-hour painting workshop. We had anatomy. No artists take anatomy anymore. Um, I'll tell you one. I'm going to just ramble a little bit. <clears throat> I was thinking about um, how great art school was and how I found myself. But this teacher came over to me in the drawing workshop. And I would draw with, I always did drawings with both hands simultaneously. And he said, why do you do that? I said, I don't know, it's the way I see. I, I kind of start from the left and move backwards. And he said, how's your reading comprehension? I said, very poor. And he put me together with somebody at the university to help me do a lot of exercises uh, for dyslexia. And it changed my life in many, many, many ways. Um, so I went to art school, which I loved. I went to graduate art school. I lied to my parents. I said I was going to study advertising, which was not true. I studied fine art. I studied painting. Um, it just brings back to me, my, my painting teacher in graduate school was a man named George McNeil. George McNeil was a founding member of the American Abstract Artists in 1936. And when he was my teacher, I was, I guess, 21 or 22. And he, I thought he was so old because he was 60. <laughs> Young, he was, yeah. And, but you know, he became my spiritual father. I just, I just loved him and we were very close. Um, and he was filled with great sayings and philosophies. Um, for example, and this has helped me in my writing, we would, we would do, by the way, I broke my finger just last week, so it looks, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so George McNeil, imagine every day for a week, a three-hour drawing workshop, <clears throat> one drawing. And at the end of the week, George would come in and make you rip up the drawing. And then you'd have to take the pieces and glue them down on a new piece of paper. And if you had trouble ripping up the first few times, he would come over and rip it in half. But I'll tell you, that is an amazing exercise. Because one, nothing is precious. You can always start again. He used to say, you're your own inventory. You know, look, you rip this drawing up, you start again. And I will tell you that... Uh, 25 years ago, 25 years ago, when I was still a serious artist, I was having an exhibition that I didn't want. It was a retrospective show, which I, three, I had different galleries, and I didn't want the show. I said, I'm, I'm too young to have a retrospective show. And so I, and I was then, don't laugh. Um, so I put, changed the date three times. Uh, they gathered, paintings from 10 years, from collectors, museums, and then they took the newest paintings I had in my studio, like five or six paintings. And that, it was a little museum in Chicago, contemporary museum, and that exhibition opened on a Friday night and burned down the next day. Burned to the ground. Not, this is not a joke. So, um, in, in like one, in an hour, I lost 10 years of work, a lot of people lost work. Um, <clears throat> it sent me, I don't like this word particularly, but it sent me on a journey because I had always, all I had wanted to be was this artist, you know, and I had been living this life and this dream. And then suddenly I had trouble painting. 
You know, I tried making copies of the paintings. Really bad idea. Very bad idea. Um, but life is also very complicated. And like three days after the fire, oh, I should tell you that my a good friend in Chicago, I'll never forget this, sent me a FedEx package. He had gone through the rubble, and he found a piece of my painting, and he packed it in this FedEx carton um, with a video of the news station of the building burning down, like over and over and over. So I put the video in, I opened this thing, you know, ashes fell out. Why would he think I would want that? Anyhow, um, three days after the fire, I was invited to the American Academy in Rome. And so, as a painter, and I was having trouble painting, but I didn't tell them that. And I packed up, my wife and I and, I and our eight-year-old daughter moved to Rome for the year. And let me tell you, Rome is the best place to be depressed. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Um, you know, I, I just would go to museums, I'd go to churches and look at paintings, I made copies of them. I started smoking again, which I'd have to hide from my wife, and my daughter would always say, Daddy, you smell like cigarettes, or something, I'd say, I don't know why. But um, I gave that up again. But um, in Rome, I, because I was painting, I had this amazing studio that overlooked Rome. I was on one of the, the academy is in Trastevere on one of the hills of Rome. And so you look out over the whole city, I mean, it's just, how could I not sit in my window and smoke a cigarette and drink an espresso, you know? Especially since I, I couldn't really paint. Um, what I did do was start a novel. And I had been writing nonfiction for the art magazines for a few years, cultural pieces. But I, I had this sort of fantasy that I would write a novel. And so I started this novel, and it was a very serious novel about like a 40-ish artist um, who had lost his work in a fire and was having, and this is true, and was having a really hard time. And then we went back, we went home after a year, and um, I read the 200 or so pages of the novel. And what I thought was I really disliked the character. I thought he was privileged and whiny and had such a great life and <laughs> You know, just, well, you know, and I have to say, you know, you, you, you lose work, let's say you lose 10 years of your work, and it is traumatic, but nobody died, it's just stuff, I could, and I really believe that now more than ever, you know, um, and so, you know, I wrote this novel, so I came home, I hated the novel, and rather than rip it up, I thought, well, I hate the guy so much, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> so I killed him in the book, on the page. And it was like three-page murder scene, uh, which I recommend if you're depressed, because you can still get up in the morning, you know? And, and I really did that. And then I did throw the book away. And I started a new novel, which became a, mis a thriller. Because I discovered I liked that. You know, killing someone on the page was just... Fine. Um, and I wrote a novel called The Death Artist, uh, and I, you know, I had had good luck, I had bad luck, I had good luck. And I had that, I had a hard copy, this was still back in the days of hard copy, and I was at Yada, which was mentioned. Yada is like an arts colony, it's the oldest arts colony in the world, so Leonard Bernstein went there, and you know, it's writers, poets, painters, everything. And it's this extraordinary place where they just take care of you. They feed you, they give you this beautiful place to live, and you feel like, why? How did, how, how did this happen? But in any case, I was painting. I was still painting, but I was working on my novel. I didn't mean to start, by the way, with my entire life. I'll wind <laughs> this up in a minute. Um, at the end of that stay at Yaddo, uh, I had become friends for some reason mostly with writers, not with the visual artists. I think because I was feeling insecure about my visual art. And so on the last day, these two writers knew that I was writing a novel. And before I left, everyone has their own individual cabin. 
I took hard, I printed out hard copies of the novel and I left it in front of their door and then I left. I just bolted home. And one of those people loved the book and gave it to their agent. And their agent called me up. Um, I remember this very well. And said to come in to her office, which was at William Morris. And it was very, um, very la-di-da. And she, I came in and she said, I love the title. And then she had like a list of things she didn't like. And she said, so you know, and this is something that if you're writing, you can think about. Anybody who writes. She said, you know, we discover something at page 300 near the end of the book. But if we knew that, at the beginning, we would all be nervous and worried. In other words, you're not doing a, don't make it a whodunit, make it bigger. It was great advice, but of course it meant a total rewrite of the book because, you know, it had to move something from the end and change it. So she, I said, well, and she came out from behind her desk, put her arm around me, which was the last time she was ever affectionate with me, and because she was really tough. And she said, go home, do the rewrite, and we'll put your daughter through college. Oh. And I did it. And by the way, she wanted it in a week. <laughs> a week. So I didn't sleep. I was teaching at the time. I called in sick. I worked on this book. I delivered it to her. She was really happy. She sold it in three days. It was bestseller. And my life was changed. You know, it's a great story. Now, I have to say, I suffered a lot in between so that you won't hate me, because I did. And it wasn't that easy. And there's a whole year or two of working on the book and not being able to paint and feeling, you know, going back to my high school insecurities and feeling like I wasn't good at anything. But that changed my life because that book was successful. And my agent then called and said, I have a two book contract for you for two more books. Now I had thought this was it, you know, I would write this book and that's, so I wrote two more books, both of them flopped. Um, that was painful. Uh, and by the, so, okay, I'll bring you where we are. So The Lost Van Gogh is my seventh novel. Um, I've written eight, eight books, one nonfiction memoir. Um, this is the seventh novel, and I've also probably done a dozen anthologies being the editor, and that's because I, I've loved working with other people, and you know, being an artist, being a writer is very isolating. You know, you're, you're alone, and if you can do something with other writers or artists, it's, I think it's really fun. Plus, if you do an, I've done these anthologies where you know, I would get to call up really famous people and ask them to write something, and then I would edit them. You know, so it was kind of crazy. But it also, I will say, it helped me, um, without even realizing it, create this body of people, you know, that I got to know in the literary world. And coming out of the art world, who here has ever participated in the art world. I'm sure some of you. Very mean place, you know, very, very cold and cool. Um, it's funny because from my New York launch, my daughter is in fashion. And she said, as she always says, what are you wearing? I said, well, I'm wearing my black jeans and a black jacket and a black shirt. She said, you're not in the art world. No, and it's gonna photograph badly. So my daughter literally made me like video my closet. She said, okay, let's move past all the black. I think I see a white shirt there. And what about like, oh, we have two blue jackets. Anyhow, the art world is all about appearances. It's a visual world. And so I came into the writing world and the writing world is actually very nice for the most part. The people are, I think, very supportive. They took me in. And they've been very generous. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, I'm trying to think where I want to where I want to go next with these. So, the last two books are kind of my favorite books. 
Um, but the last Mona Lisa, you know, my mother would be so annoyed at me that I'm here chewing gum. <laughs> so I'm trying to think what I can stick it on. Is it gum back in the, in the gum? No, I'll put it back in here. <laughs> my mother once came, I was doing this series of lectures at Harvard, I was invited, and my mother came, and I was chewing gum, and she said, all I could see was you <coughs> chewing gum. I said, Anyhow. Um, so the last Mona Lisa, uh, I had not written a novel for a number of years. Uh, my life had changed very dramatically, in some way, let's say not somewhat, but tragically. And uh, my wife had died very suddenly, you know, in a matter of minutes, um, in my arms, unexpectedly, and I couldn't do anything. I just couldn't do anything. And I had a contract for two, two books, I couldn't write them. And I went to Yaddo again, and um, I didn't think I could even leave home, but the people at Yaddo knew me from over the years, and I remember the director called me and said, Yaddo is a loving, nurturing place. Come. We, we will take care of you. And while I was there, I had, I'm sure many of you, some of you have experienced loss and grief, because we all do in, at some point. And I, do, I will say that I think our losses are very individual to us, but they share a commonality. I mean, I, I believe that after going through it, I kept a diary, um, like a notebook, because I was very disoriented and I couldn't figure out my time and what I was doing. And the only time I felt like myself was when I would go in to teach, because I had to perform. And my st students had no idea what was going on with me. But in any case, I went to Yaddo and I had four, you know, like composition notebooks. And I just started transcribing them. And then um, I didn't think it would be a book. I was doing it for my mind. And then when I came back from Yada, Joyce Carol Oates again had written a book of, about her experience as a widow. And so I said, would you read a, a little of what I've written? And she read it. And she said, you know, Johnny, you have to publish this book because very few men write books like this. And she was my champion for that book. And I have to say that it was not a book that felt cathartic to me, but I still almost every day get an email or a letter from someone. And so I do feel like it was a good thing to do. And when I, uh, I hear from a lot of, a lot of men who say, you know, thank you for putting into words what I couldn't. Um, my daughter's never read it, I should say. That was interesting. I can understand that. Anyway, so, finally, it was a lead up as to why I was telling you that. I had started The Last Mona Lisa 12 years ago, 12 years ago. And it was, the inspiration was that I discovered, like many of you might know, that the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre in 1911. So a disgruntled Louvre employee, a carpenter, was fired. He hid in a closet overnight, came out on a day the museum was closed, took the panel off the wall, and he had been the carpenter who made the frame. So he knew just how to do it. Took the painting off, nobody was in the museum. Took the painting off, put it under his jacket, his Louvre employee jacket, threw the frame in a stairwell, left. The Louvre didn't know the painting was missing for two days. Nobody noticed that the painting was missing. One department thought it's being cleaned, another department thought something else. So I took this idea as the beginning, and also that I did a lot of research about this guy, Vincenzo Perugia, and the, forgive me, Vincenzo, he didn't have a very interesting life. So I decided to invent his life and use the facts of what he did and some of the facts, but to give him a much more romantic life. So the book traces, it starts with um, him stealing the painting and you're inside his head because I really read and researched it. 
And then you, you trace how that painting gets to my protagonist, you know. And that, so the book goes back and forth in time, and it mixes fact and fiction, which I love. And while I was writing that book, um, I became upset. I was finished with it, pretty much. But I became obsessed with the French resistance in World War II. I saw a couple of movies, and I started reading about it, and I discovered that the way the French were protecting art and paintings, artifacts from the Nazis, they did all kinds of things. And one of the things you have to think about is the way the French thought about art when they were occupied. To them, it was their heritage was being stolen. It's not just an object, it's not just a drawing, it's not just a painting. This was their heritage, this was French culture. And they risked their lives for this work, you know, to protect this work. And I read this account of an artist in the French Resistance who painted over famous paintings with like clowns and stuff. So the Nazis wouldn't know what was under it. And I went, oh, I gotta do this. So the book starts with that and it traces, so you have a contemporary story and then it goes back and forth between these little things, tracing how the painting moved from 1944 and ended up in an upstate New York um, flea market. You know, that's my, that was my other thing that inspired me, which was the idea of, you know, going to a flea market and buying a painting and you get it home and it's something remarkable, you know, which everybody wants that fantasy. Um, so mine's a little, different, but, uh, you know, I, I just, I thought about that. And so, th so this book has this, a very similar structure to The Last Mona Lisa, and it also has the same three main characters. Uh, Luke Peroni, who is, um, it's really funny, because people always say to me, are you Luke? Yes. Well, Luke is 37. Okay, right? Uh, he's very tall. Thank you. Well, I mean, as a writer, you're all your characters in some way. It's absolutely true, so you're a writer. Yeah. So they're, yeah, so they're in your head. They become part of your life. Yes, John. Jonathan, we've actually read the book. Oh. And it's absolutely wonderful. It's a um, mystery within a history. It's a history within a mystery, and several mysteries, actually, that you've woven them together. And, I think your background, certainly in art, helps to bring that all to life, and it was really terrific. So that that being Thank said, you. This... and I've read the other one, the Mona Lisa. This one I loved. I really liked this last one. You know, I'm, I just want to interrupt you to say, well, first of all, thank you. This is also Kathy Epstein, who, now I'm really going to show how politically incorrect I am. I, Kathy was in an art group that I took around, and I referred to them in my head as my Greenwich girls. Um, but you don't mind that, right? No. They were all wonderful and smart. Anyway. Uh, I just want to say that I was worried about this book because the last Mona Lisa was very successful. And so you always, if you're me, you think the next book's going to be a bomb, you know. But it turns out people like it even better, which is great, you know. I think it has more action in it and really was very good. My question, do yes. you have a question? So you use the same characters in both books. Yeah. Do you have plans for another book with these characters. Um, certainly, Alexis's father would be interesting to know more about. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> I've actually started, you know, I didn't think there'd be a second book, totally. I started a third book. And if, if, since you read The Last Mona Lisa, The Last Mona Lisa is Luke's book. You know, I think it's his story. Luke's great-grandfather, by the way, is Vincent Perugia, who stole the Mona Lisa. And his girlfriend, Alexis, who's much more than his girlfriend, she's an art historian and she's brilliant. Her father's a, 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 an art thief, huge like art thief. Um, and then the third character in the book, John Washington Smith, is an Interpol agent. And you know, when you do these kind of books, 
the most fun parts are interviewing people. You know, so I interviewed FBI agents, um, the art, art squads, and Scotland Yard, great guy from Scotland Yard, um, and a an couple of Interpol, one Interpol agent I based my character on. So The Last Mona Lisa is Luke's book, even though he, they're all in it. I think this book is John Washington Smith's book. I mean, I felt him stealing the book in the middle, because he takes the most chances. He's risking his life more than anyone. And I really, I mean, I, I love him, but, you know, I, getting back to this gentleman, you know, with characters, people say to me, well, do you love the bad guys? And when I'm writing them, I do. You know, I mean, yeah, I'm right there with them. And if they're really evil and horrible, they're even much more fun to write than the good guys. So the third book, I mean, I started it. I have to see, you know, how, if it's going to pan out. But it's going to be Alex's book. It's going to, because I think she deserves a book. And that way it can be, um, you know, that's it. A trinity and then I'm out, you know. Because uh, I'm also, I think it's because now that I've gotten older, I'm very aware of time wasted. I'm aware of like the clock on the wall. And I just am working like crazy. So I'm also working on something that I don't know how my publisher is going to feel because it's a love story. A very dark love story, of course, but it is a love story. And it's not, although I think there are two love stories in The Last Mona Lisa, because there's Vincenzo in the past, and then Luke and Alex in the, and I just have to tell you that I, so I've been talking to these filmmakers who probably won't make it, though they say they will, um, and I suggested they get the same actors to play Vincent in the past, and Simone, and Luke and Alex in the present. Because that's the way I imagined them, these two couples over through time, you know. So, in any case, um, yeah, there's a third book, I think. Somebody else. You know, you're just going to hear me blather on if you don't ask a question. <laughs> It'll be very unfocused. Kind of question. Yes. Um, so where did your daughter end up at college? The uh, editor said she was going to pay for it. Wait, wait, wait. Oh! <laughs> she was nine years old then. I have no idea how old she, she turned. Was. She turned nine in Rome, and when we lived in Rome. And I'll tell you, so my daughter, um, well, my wife was very determined that our daughter would go, had to go to like a brilliant Ivy League school. She had this in her head. So my daughter was all set to go to Vassar. And then she came and visited me at Yaddo in Saratoga Springs. And I went over to the Skidmore Library. And my daughter came with me and she said, do you think they'd take me here? I said, I don't know, give it a shot. And she went to Skidmore and she loved it because she was the product of a New York City private school where, you know, academically, you can never get an A. It's really tough. Um, Looking back, I'm really sorry we didn't take her out of there, but that's another story. But she loved Skidmore. Uh, by the time she went to college, it was long past that 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 money. You know. It wasn't as much money as would never have gotten her through college. <laughs> so, all right, I'm doing this. Can I read? I'm going to read. I have a question. Oh, please, Mr. Ross. Are you still painting? Uh, yes, I am still. Well, here's what. I draw every day. And I explain to people that, so when I'm writing, writing to me is very intense. It makes my head hurt, and I get very overwrought. So I'll go into my studio, and I'll draw for a while. But I'll tell you what I do in my paintings. Some people may know this, is I'm a legal forger. So a couple of times a year, I will take on a commission painting, and I, I, I do a, a fake for somebody. You know, like collectors who are giving, let's say they're giving a painting to a museum and they want a copy. So I'll make a copy. And, or people who just want something. My very first client was a Wall Street guy 
who called me up and he had seen some copies I had done. I had made them in Rome. And he said, you know, I was part of a, an auction at Sotheby's for a friend's client painting from 1950. And I dropped out at X amount of money. Would you make that painting for me? I said, yeah, okay. And then he said, it's gonna go in the atrium of my Wall Street firm. I said, oh, well then it has to follow certain rules because if you're gonna copy something and pub the public's gonna see it. So what I ended up doing was painting the painting exactly every drip, every mark, but in mirror image. But, and he's great. I've made several fakes for him. And he said when people came to see the Franz Klein, they said, oh, you, you bought it. You got it at auction. And he said, nope, mine's newer and cleaner. <laughs> so, so it's really, you know, I'll tell you what that's done for me personally. Like in the last Mona Lisa, there's an art forger based on a true char real character. I know exactly what that's like. I was inside that guy's head when he was making the fakes of, you know what happened with the Mona Lisa is that while it was missing for two years, these guys made copies and sold them. So I'm not gonna tell you except that, um, I will tell you this sort of funny story. So I pulled a lot of strings to be able to get into the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa by myself. So there's a scene in the last Mona Lisa when Luke is standing there, it's just he and two guards and the painting. And that was me, you know, seeing my reflection in the glass. Anyhow, so they were very, very nice to me. But when the book came out, a couple of people who had helped me at the Louvre, this one curator, they were really angry at me because I cast the idea into the air that their painting could be a fake. So I don't, I was in Paris not long ago and I just, you know, sneaked in by myself with the crowd to see the Mona Lisa because I know they're not my best friend anymore. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'll tell you, doing research, that's the greatest thing. I mean, I went to Florence and I lived in the Piazza de Madonna, which is where Luke lives. And I actually got to have myself locked in a cell because the prison where Vincenzo Perugia went when he was arrested for stealing the painting still exists. It's closed, but a friend of mine, it has a little art center. So I got into the, into the you know, and it was, then I used that scene in the book and it was like, it was amazing, except I don't speak Italian and this guy locked me in the cell and left. <laughs> and I, you know, there's that, you know, 10 minutes pass and 20 minutes pass, and I'm like, okay. now what, you know? He came back eventually, but it was a little, it was intense, it was intense. So, but I, I, you know, the great part of any kind of, these are all historical novels, historical fiction, mix of, the great part is traveling, you know? So, um, as people say, you know, oh, was your research hard? It's not a hardship to go live in Florence for a month, you know? Or, and for this book, um, so I went to Amsterdam, um, I, I went to the Van Gogh Museum, um, and then through another, see I have, because of my art world connections, I, I always call on these friends of mine, and one of my friends got me to another friend, and I knew I was gonna have a scene at the Anne Frank house, I knew it. And so I got to be in the Anne Frank house just with him alone and into the rooms that are not shown to the public. But because the scene in the book, they're on a tour, I never used any of, of that. Uh, but you know, those are extraordinary things that happen. Or, so Van Gogh, if you don't know this, so he, he had been in, in Arles, he had been in the asylum in Saint-Rémy, and he moved to a little town north of Paris, about an hour from Paris, auvers sur -Ouise. If you go to Paris, it is worth the trip. It's beautiful, it's an hour on a really nice train. The town is so beautiful, and it's the place where he lived. So I went, and I took with me this, um, <laughs> my, my, I said to this French friend of mine, can I just borrow Michelle, the woman he lives with, to come with me to auvers sur because I need a French, somebody who, my French is bad. So she 
it was so great. There we were at this place. So you, Van Gogh's room is an attic room. It's like, I don't know, like just that little corner. The most famous artist we know lived in this monk-like cell. And you're not allowed in, but Michelle talked the guard into it. And so I got, I didn't, I couldn't sit in the chair, but I did stand in his room. And I have to say, it just killed me. And Van Gogh lived in this town for 70 days, and he made 75 paintings in 70 days. Um, you know, he was in a manic phase. And, um, and he plays a part in this book, not just the painting. Um, and uh, he was an artist I loved from the time I was a little boy. I never expected to be putting him in a book, but it was fun to, really fun to do it. And um, anyhow, I'll read you two pages, okay? Oh, yeah. please, I'd rather request. I have a question about artificial intelligence, AI, and how you feel about it since you're both an artist. And yeah, I hate it. I really hate it. I mean, I'm glad it's happening toward the later part of my life. You know, I have a young technical assistant who does all of my stuff, and he's always forcing AI on me, you know. But you know, I'm, I'm insecure enough to think it can do everything better than I can. Yeah. So I, I, although I will say, you know, there, there's a program that um, Amazon and different companies are using where they just take your books and take your work. And so some of us have a, actually a big lawsuit going on because they have taken some of my books, which they program. I mean, if they write my third book for me and it's good, hey, okay. But, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's here to stay. What are we going to do, right? Um, it, it all, uh, if you read something that they've made based on another writer, it feels weird. But maybe it's going to get better. But I can't help hating it. It feels like artists will be replaced, you know, and, and um, I happen to be a big fan of the independent object, you know, the handmade object, the handwritten book, all that s stuff, I think, is something our culture, we don't, to me, I don't want to lose it, that's all, you know, so, yes. I have a question, uh, what authors do you feel have influenced you in your work? Excuse me, what influence? What authors. 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 Um, yeah, a lot of authors have influenced my work. Um, well, from when I was a kid, uh, Edgar Allan Poe was huge. My Hardy Boys collection. I would get a Hardy Boys book every month. And you know, when I first started publishing, I had this fantasy that I would write a Hardy Boys book. Then I found out what they pay. So, but I loved the Hardy Boys. And then as I grew up a little, Patricia Highsmith, you know, talented Mr. Ripley, Strangers on a Train. If you want to read a perfect novel, Strangers on a Train, which Hitchcock, by the way, had sent somebody to buy it from Patricia Highsmith so she wouldn't know it was Hitchcock, so he could buy it cheap. Um, and he changes it a lot. It's a great movie, but the book is excellent. And she was 25 years old. Um, and it's just this perfect, basically two-character book. And then Raymond Chandler. I love Raymond Chandler. And Raymond Chandler, to me, doesn't know how to write a plot. But I find plot the hardest thing. But Raymond Chandler is a very visual writer. And that's what I'm interested in. Like, I'm reading a book now, which I won't name, but it's getting tons of attention. It's probably going to be a bestseller. It's so non-visual that I, I can't see anything. And I don't mean that we describe, you know, short guy, sandy hair going white, you know, glasses. No, not that. I just want to feel it. I want to see it. And there's none of that in there. So Raymond Chandler, there's a short story called Red Dust. I'm going to get it wrong. It's so beautiful. I mean, it's just like you're there in the desert and the color and the, and I love that. So he's a big one for me. When I'm writing my books, I don't read any thrillers or mysteries ever 
because I feel like I'm going to start writing like that person. Or I don't read anybody who has a very specific style because I know I'm, I'm like a copycat and I'll be doing that. But I love, you know, people I became friendly with, Michael Connolly, I love his books. I think he's a great writer. And he's the nicest, nicest guy in the world. Um, who else? I mean, I, I, you know, but right now I'm reading, I read a book called The Art Thief, nonfiction book. Do you know this book? Yes. It is great, right? <laughs> really fun about this lunatic guy who stole all this art, kept it to himself. Really good book. And, you know, so I'm, you know, I just, I read, I, I like all different kinds of books. So, you know, I'm not um, specific, honestly. So clearly I'm not going to read. So it's okay. So we'll fill it in with, with questions. And so I'm waiting for the writer question. Uh, well, I actually, I, I am curious for you because you are both a visual and a artist and a writer. Um, your thoughts on how what you learned in terms of what you're trying to communicate as a visual artist influences your thoughts as a writer and what you're trying to do for your audience when you're writing? It's a great question. Um, I would say this, that the great thing art school gave me was discipline. You know, because that same teacher, I have, I have quotes over my desk, and I have one of his quotes, and it was, Nobody forces you to do this, so don't complain. <laughs> and, you know, and he also would say to us, this was in painting school, really, he'd say, look, you have to work every single day. You wake up, you're in a bad mood, you have a headache, it doesn't matter, because you don't know what's going to happen that day. And it's absolutely true. So you find your inspiration. If you're going to wait for inspiration, you're in big trouble. You're never going to get anything done. That's the difference between an amateur and a professional. Well, it's a job. Yeah. You know, it's a job. I, I live in a pretty big loft, but I also have a separate office. And the reason I have that separate office is if I stay home, I suddenly have a desire to wash the floors you know, <laughs> rather than work. Or, you know, I don't know. Gee, I better make dinner. You know, So I leave every day. I take my laptop. And I think... If you're going to do this, any you know the arts as nobody forces you to do it. So if you're going to do it, you're the only one who's going to force you to do it. Uh, yes, you may then you'll get a contract, and they'll force you to do it. But um, that's a little bit different, you know. And that's a, by the way, a tremendous amount of pressure. It sounds so great, but it is a tremendous amount of pressure to know that you have a contract and they are waiting for that book, and that there's an editor, a copy editor, a proofreader, and you know, all these people, and yeah. And the copy editors, just want to give you a minute if you've never published a book. So a copy editor fixes your grammar and your continuity. And in the old days, it was post-it, so you'd get your hard copy back with like literally 400 post-its. Now it's track changes. So when I get a manuscript back, I have my editor, the copy editor, my agent, a proofreader. So you have five different copy, you know, and it's really awful, really <laughs> awful, because you can't see it. And the copy editor, you know, so you're in your, I'm there and I'm looking at it and I get furious because they're also criticizing you. And they're all telling you one thing or another thing and, yeah, and it brings out the li little bad boy in me, you know? Like, I don't have the hard copy to throw on the floor and curse, you know? I just have to slam my laptop, so. But, um, but I think if I didn't have a contract, I wouldn't finish anything. Yeah. I just wouldn't. And does everyone feel that way about a lot of things, though? Yes. Right? Yes. Douglas Adams, who wrote The Hitchhiker's Guide, used to say that he loved deadlines. He loved the rushing sound they made as they went by. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I was brought up in a way that both of my parents believed you had to do what was expected of you. So, like, when I'm late for a deadline, I'm like a wreck, like a total wreck. I feel like such a bad person, and, um, and everybody's late. Everyone's late. So, yeah, um, 
I'm just curious here, other than this gentleman, who, anybody write? Doing any writing? You're right. Oh, there's quite a few people who write. See, writing is very different than visual art because a visual thing you see, it's right in front of you and you can react to it. A book, you have to keep the whole thing in your head. So you feel like your brain's gonna fall out your ears. It's very, it's very uh, stressful to do it in that way, you know, which is why I make a lot of notes. And, um, and usually at a certain point, when the deadline is overdue, you hand it in and hope for the best. You know, that's, that's, that's all, so. Last question, yes. So when you get all this feedback after you submitted it and they submit it back to you, how do you process all this? I mean, are you compelled to make all these changes or do you allow the artistic freedom to pick and choose what you want to accept well, as? Well, it is your book, but here's what. I have figured out the percentages. First of all, I hope nobody from my publishers here. First of all, I get the changes. You know, I get these track changes, and I look through. First of all, my my agent was a Random House editor for twenty years, so she edits my books first before they go to the publisher, and she is great. She's great, but she can be harsh. You know, like this book in its earlier version. She, she first, you know, like typically, like this is good, this is good, and then she said, and somewhere in there is a good book. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, when I get the criticism from all of these other people, my first reaction is I hate their guts. I just hate them. I think they're wrong. I think they're ridiculous. I, I stomp around. I curse. And then I sit down and I Try, I make a list of their things and I see which things I think I can do, which things I think are wrong. Um, and I realized about three books ago, ago if I do 35 to 40% of what they want, that's enough. I tell them I've done it all. I mean, I, I do. I said I did. These were great suggestions. Great. Um, but, you know, a lot of times, these are professionals, you know, so they have great ideas. In the, in the last Mona Lisa, my editor said to me, I don't feel close enough to Alex, and she's your one important woman character. She said, can you give me one chapter from her point of view? I want to see her. And I said, I don't know that I can do it because I, I think that it doesn't, and I did it, and it changed the whole book. It made me go back to every chapter that she was in because I understood her more. And um, so it's kind of the bratty baby in me that has that bad reaction because sometimes they're not right. But you know, they have, a lot of these people have very good ideas. I mean, very good ideas. And my editor is very nice. You know, she will always tell me the book is great, even when it's not. And, and then she'll, you know, give me, not criticism, she'll make suggestions of things she would like to, I would like to see you do this, or, you know. But, you know, I, um, I will say that here's the best advice. Have one book be very successful, because then they'll let you do what you want. <laughs> because, you know, I changed the contract, but the last book was successful, so they said, okay. I, gave, I did something really, I have to repeat two things, because Joyce Carol Oates is a big deal, and I love her dearly. And she said, you are expanding the genre. This is beyond a thriller. And, you know, I mean, here we are in front of this huge crowd, and I'm like, just can I? Did somebody get that on tape? You know, but well, I am. I, blurbs. Yeah, well, she had already given me a blurb because. Um, but you know, it's very important what you know, what your what your peers think. It just is. Other writers, you know. I mean, um, but I. Th it, it's tough. It can be tough. I mean, I try not to read my reviews, but then. If I read the good reviews, I feel obligated to, you know, I don't read the bad reviews because they are knives in my heart. 
seriously. I mean, like, I'll never, you know, I don't know. I can get 20 great reviews and one person will say something bad and that's what I remember. So, you know, paging Dr. Freud and the team from Vienna, but, you know, I think it's just very difficult. Uh, anyhow, I would suggest if you have a good team and you're a decent publisher, you at least listen to them after you have your little fit. That's what I do, you know, so. And I don't, I don't do everything, but they make my books better. I think it's a good thing. So do we have one more question? Is that it, or are we finished? I'm asking that. One more question from someone? Some lurking, burning question? <laughs> Has anybody ever asked you to do a screenplay? I've done, I've done a couple of screenplays, yes. Um, I actually wrote the screenplay for The Death Artist, and I worked um, on the TV series for my book, Anatomy of Fear, which was in pre-production, and then the writer's strike happened, and it fell apart. Uh, I don't want to write screenplays for these. Um, I'd rather give that over to... I, I like the form of the screenplay, but I think I'd rather give these over to somebody else, you know, so... And I'd like to see these as a series. I meant an original screenplay. Oh, an original screenplay. Hmm. I don't think so. Because, um, you know, screenplays are like bare bones. Um, I, I tried one, it felt unsatisfying to me. I then wanted to write the book, you know? So that sort of you know, defeats the purpose. I have a lot of screenwriter friends so, who do that and write original work. Um, I worked briefly in Hollywood as a uh, script doctor, and I really didn't like it. It was just not for me, you know, I just, um, the environment wasn't for me, so, but, yeah. yeah. The book's always better than the movie. <laughs> I think well, so too. You know, I agree. I agree. Yeah, but you know what you have to say, Ron? You have to say they're two different species, you know? So a book is always very internal, you know, you're inside that book. Movies very you can do things very quickly in a movie, you know, like you can put it out there. And I learned a lot from films. I mean, because I'm I love movies. I've always loved movies. And I think they formed a lot of the way I write and the way I see. Um, you know, Hitchcock taught me a lot, you know, and, and this by the way, a great documentary. It came from a book called Hitchcock Truffaut. It's a really good documentary where Francois Truffaut from the New Wave is interviewing Alfred Hitchcock. And the French discovered Hitchcock as an artist. He was considered an actor. And then, but you know, um, Hitchcock's a genius, you know, visual genius. And uh, so I learn a lot, you know, and Hitchcock talks about, for example, in suspense, you know, if I'm sitting here talking to Jeff Brown, who I know, and we're in a cafe, and the audience can see that there's a bomb under our table, it doesn't matter what we say, you know, because the audience is freaking out. So what that tells me to learn as a writer is you must let the, your reader know more than the characters. So it's that thing like, don't open that door, because the reader knows something that the characters don't know. So as the writer, you hope you're always a few steps ahead of your characters. Not always true. That's not always true, but yes, Jeff. Jonathan passed over as part of uh, being a teacher, but I was a student of Jonathan's. And all those things that Jonathan says happens to him, if you give Jonathan something to, to read, you get more writing than you can believe. <laughs> <laughs> but it's helpful, right? And it's all helpful. And yes, the same reaction is no, no, no. Yes, yes. You yes. were, you were, you didn't get bad at me in class. Some no. people do. I mean, I, I do have a tendency to edit right on the page, which is annoying. I had an editor who's now my friend. He's not my editor anymore. And this was in the hard copy days, and he would do that, and then he would continue on the back of the page, like sentences and sentences. And I, one time took my manuscript, I tied it up with rope, 
and I wrote, write your own book, <laughs> and I brought it to his office. <laughs> well, we became great friends. No, I never felt like that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, um, I love teaching, though. I, 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 mean, I taught painting, and then I taught writing, and I, I love it. So I think we're over. I'm going to go here. You can ask me more questions if you buy a book, and I'll be happy to sign it. And uh, I, you got away with me not reading because better off, right? It's more fun. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it.